Hi, everybody. Welcome to Get to Know the Friend, an evening with Elaine Bishop. As many of you already know, my name is Nancy Russell, and I'm the program coordinator of the Criminal Justice Program at the Canadian Friends Service Committee, CFSC. Some of you may remember the previous program monikers like Quaker Committee on Jails and Justice or Quakers Fostering Justice. Please take note that this evening will be recorded. It is being recorded. You probably noticed when you came in that it said this meeting is being recorded. And that's so that we can share it in the Quaker archives and with any friends who would not be able to join us tonight. So if you don't want to be recorded, which is fine, the best way to manage that is to turn off your, your camera. So where it says stop video at the bottom of your Zoom screen, if you click on that, then you won't. Now your, your name will probably be displayed, but it'll be a black screen with your name, but it won't have, uh, it won't have the video of you. Um, so the CFSC office and where I live is located on the traditional territory of the Wendat, Petun Nation, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. This land has been the site of human activity for over 15,000 years and is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum, a sacred treaty between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek. The people online with us tonight are from all across Turtle Island and we acknowledge and respect the people of this land. If we could please begin with a few moments of silent worship or silent reflection. Thank you. Thank you, friends. I'd like to, well, you've already met Kira, most of you, um, but I'd like, I'll introduce her again. She's our coordinator of programs and events. And Kira's just going to guide us through some tech and housekeeping info for tonight. Thanks, Nancy. Um, just very quickly, I just want to give a few reminders. Um, if you could keep yourself muted uh, while Elaine is speaking and Nancy is speaking, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, just a reminder to keep the discussion and the chat a safe and respectful space for all. Uh, if you're having connectivity issues, um, I just recommend that you turn off your video. And if that's not working, I suggest that you leave the meeting and then re-enter and I, I'll be sure to let you back in. And sometimes that fixes it. Um, I'm not a, a tech genius, so turning it on and off is, is my suggestion. Um, 
And just a reminder that this, for those that have joined us since Nancy said it, um, this evening is being recorded for the Quaker Archives and for folks that are not able to join us tonight. So if you do not want to be recorded, please turn off your video. Um, and I'm just asking that everybody, um, if you could keep your questions for Elaine until the very end, there'll be time for discussion. Um, and I encourage you to, to speak up during the discussion instead of putting things in chat as it's just a little bit, we don't have to split our attention quite as much. Um, but other than that, I'll, I'll pass it back to Nancy. Thanks. Thanks, Kira. So for those of you joining us for the first time, tonight's event is hosted by the Canadian Friends Service Committee. CFSC was founded in 1931, and it's the Peace and Justice Social Agency of Quakers in Canada. CFSC seeks to alleviate suffering and works to develop transformative and sustainable approaches to human rights, justice, and peace. Canadian Friends Service Committee has been a federally registered charity since 1967 and is a not-for-profit organization. 2021 is our 90th anniversary and Get to Know the Friend is a series and part of our, or part of CFSC celebration of 90 years of service. We encourage you and invite you to visit our anniversary website, which has wonderful stories and photos remembering the 90 years of service work. Kira will post the link in chat. And if you know, if any of you know friends in any of the photos or you have information about projects, please let us know. And there's a way to do that on the website. There's a form that can be accessed from the top of that webpage, the 90 anniversary webpage under the stories heading. And we'll be sure to include your contributions and your remembrances on the website. So please, we invite you to do that. CFSC is hosting a night just like this one on the last Thursday of every month for all of 2021. We hope you'll continue to join us for the Get to Know the Friends series and enjoy discussion, sharing, and friendship together. It's an honor for me to introduce tonight's speaker, Elaine Bishop. Now, I've not known Elaine very long, so I decided to take a research Elaine Bishop journey earlier this afternoon. And I had a wonderful time. I could have still been there, there's so much. Here is some of what, just some of what I found out. Elaine was born in England where her father was a member of the Royal Air Force during the Second World War and her mother was a nurse. They came to Canada in 1951, settling in Winnipeg seven years later. Elaine has held numerous roles in many locations in the world. Her very first volunteer role was at the Winnipeg YWCA with the junior leaders in the early 1960s. I can't tell you exactly how old Elaine was then, but I do know that her birthday is on August 12th. She grew up on Grant Avenue in Winnipeg and according to a Winnipeg Free Press article written about Elaine in 2012, she lives in a tiny house on Austin Street trimmed with the color of pink, where she tends to her prairie roses and cherry bushes. Now I happen to know that Elaine continues to enjoy her garden and was planting peas in that very same garden just two days ago. Elaine was the coordinator of the Quaker Committee on Jails and Justice from 1976 to 1978. She was a member of the collective running Bryony House, the first Atlantic Canada shelter for battered women in Halifax from 1980 to 1982. She was the executive director of Collins House, an emergency woman shelter from 83 to 86. Elaine was the coordinator of CFSC from 1987 to 1991. And in 1988, while I was giving birth to my son, Zachary, Elaine was sitting in a jail cell in Peace River. And I'll leave it to all of you to ask her about that. Elaine was the recording clerk of Canadian Yearly Meeting from 1981 to 85, and then the clerk of Canadian Yearly Meeting from 1992 to 1994. She was something that was named the resident warden at Glasgow Quaker Meeting House in Scotland from 1997 to 2003. And this is just some of it. Elaine also authored several reports and publications, in particular, several that she wrote during or shortly after working for the Quaker Committee on Jails and Justice, 
Criminal Justice was the second of the Argenta Press Canadian Quaker pamphlets. She also wrote Celebration, which was the 18th pamphlet in that series, and chapter 14 entitled The Sacred Nature of Places. Elaine wrote that, which was in the court, was published in the Court Watcher's Manual by the Church Council on Justice and Corrections. Lastly, I want to share just a few of the many quotes and comments about Elaine that I came across this afternoon. A woman who has devoted her life to fighting injustice and inequality. She's very compassionate. She doesn't blame anybody. She just tries to help them. Elaine offers an island of safety. This one really made me smile. She's more productive than a platoon of police officers. <laughs> <laughs> and what's really significant to understand about Elaine is that her Quaker life and her service and what she does in her personal life are all blended together. It's what we hold in high esteem in the Quaker community. So as Kira said, we ask that you hold your questions and comments to the end. And again, it's such a great honor to give you Elaine Bishop. Elaine. Well, good evening, friends. And Nancy, thank you for that very fulsome introduction. Um, I told Nancy as we were getting together at the beginning that I've never Googled myself. I had no idea that that was all on the web. Um, I would like to acknowledge that this evening I am coming to you from Treaty One uh, in what is called Winnipeg, Manitoba. And this is the homeland of the Cree, Anishinaabe and Dakota peoples and of the Métis Nation. The electricity that is allowing me to connect with you by Zoom actually comes down to us from treaties three and five in Northern Manitoba from the uh, hydropower plants that have destroyed a lot of indigenous communities. And our water comes from treaty three to the east uh, and for a hundred years uh, isolated uh, an indigenous community. Um, so, that is the territory that I am from. As my Indigenous friends have helped me to learn, I will start off by saying that I am the daughter of Edward and Muriel. Uh, Nancy spoke a little bit about them. And um, I partly start there because that's where both my Quaker and my Canadian journeys started. So many of us Quakers have a favorite testimony that is a sort of lens through which we do everything. And mine is Quaker Peace Testimony. So I want to start by sharing with you my favorite um, section from Quaker Faith and Practice. And it's neither our own Canadian one nor uh, the Early Meeting Red Book. It's actually from what was our faith and practice before we created our own um, the Blue Book. So Kira, if you would put up um, the first slide. When considering the character and basis of our testimony for peace, we have felt strongly that its deepest foundation lies in the nature of God and that its character must be inclusive of the whole of life. There is urgent need for a fuller recognition that God's essential nature is love and that there is a seed of God God in every person. That spiritual forces are the mightiest and that we must be prepared to rely upon them and give expression to them in daily work and character, as well as in what we call the great crises of life. We must set before us the highest ideal, that which ought to be rather than that which is, believing that God is not alone the God of things as they are, the God of things as they are meant to be. And that was written in 1920, coming out of the All Friends Peace Conference, which was actually uh, envisioned during uh, World War I, when both British and US friends were deeply concerned by the number of young friends that went into the military in that war. My sense is that the highest ideal is what we've been working for all along in CFSC. 
Diffusy has been a thread throughout my life. Um, and it's been an incredible gift to me. Part of that gift has been all of the people that we connect with. And it's, it's just so wonderful to see some of your faces um, this evening. And I'm reminded of a, a film character who, when he was being um, appreciated and honored for a very heroic deed, said, it was never just me, it never really is. And that is part of my feeling about service committee. It's all of us working together. It's never just one of us. So it's really an honor to be able to share a few of the highlights of my CFSC journey, which actually started very early in my Canadian life. Um, when our family of mom and dad and my brother Adrian and myself arrived in Canada in 1951, Quakers were those people who welcomed us. I would love now to know the story of how that came about. What I do know is that during World War I, uh, II, both my parents went from high school into World War II. And on the base hospital that mom nursed at, there was a friend's ambulance unit. So that by the end of World War II, she actually registered as a conscientious objector. And in some way that I don't understand, by the time we came to Canada in 1951, my parents had made connection with Quakers. And so Fred Haslam, whom some of you may remember, um, and uh, Maud Haslam welcomed us into their home and helped us to uh, come to know uh, Canada. And Fred was the first secretary of Canadian Friends Service Committee. Uh, and one of the early stories I heard of that, of our early days in Canada was a trip to Camp Nakonis. And for those who don't know, Camp Nakonis was under the care of CFSC from 1932 until 1962. And that course, 1951, 1952 was during that time. <clears throat> Most of my childhood was actually spent in Winnipeg where we moved in 1957. And at that time, um, there were only two speakers in Winnipeg. And part of the story of Winnipeg meeting was how it started in the uh, mid to late 50s, but that has to be for another day. I came back to Ontario in 1966 to go to the University of Guelph. And my journey with service committee picked up during that time. Um, I was astounded, perhaps I shouldn't have been surprised that the University of Guelph when I got there uh, was not known as a place of peace activism. And so Murray Thompson, and so uh, if you could put on um, number two, Kara, that would be great. Murray Thompson, who was then the peace education secretary of Canadian Friends Service Committee, and, and this is Murray, uh, helped me organize um, the first that we know of peace vigil to be held on Remembrance Day at the University of Guelph. And then later that year to put on um, a film, um, a celebration of peace films. The only one of which I can remember is that the East of, is Red, which was about China and um, in the mid 60s, there was still a lot of lack of knowledge about China and a lot of hostility. So um, what I, I was also one of those people who during this time um, was part of CFSC's Medical Aid to Vietnam program. At the time, um, CFSC was sending medical aid to all three parts of Vietnam north to south on the demilitarized zone as part of our witness against the Vietnam War. Um, and on the uh, photograph gallery on the website, there is a photograph of people packing medical aid to go to Vietnam. And I actually think that I'm the young person on the left-hand side of um, the photo. The names of, of folks aren't there, but I think that is me. Um, and so that was part of my initial volunteer work with service committee. I wanted to share a couple of memories um, about that time. Uh, one was an event um, related to Canadian Friends, Canadian Young Friends Yearly Meeting. 
uh, we did a witness with U.S. young friends where we, and I don't remember how we drove down, but we drove down to one of the border crossings, probably in Windsor, and we Canadian young friends walked across the border, met with young friends in the U.S. for worship. And our, our activity was to bring medical supplies and checks that U.S. friends had collected back to service committee for the medical aid to Vietnam program. So this was part of U.S. friends opposition to the Vietnam War. Now we knew this was illegal for the U.S. friends to be involved in that. So the Canadian uh, young friends were given all of the U.S. checks to bring back and the U.S. young friends had some physical bandages and other sorts of medical aid. And when we walked back across the border, we Canadians were allowed to go through. So the checks got through. U.S. young friends were stopped. The medical supplies taken from them and they were then allowed to continue on to come into Canada. We continued to um, Friends House in Toronto where we worshiped again and delivered those U.S. checks to um, medical aid to Vietnam uh, program. And one of the things that FSC really needs to be recognized for, as well as our then bank, is that we cashed those checks, even though it was illegal from the US side for those checks to be cashed, and our bank accepted those checks to contribute to the medical aid to Vietnam program. So one of the people, um, very much beloved, and Kira, if you could put number three up now, uh, who was very involved in that program and in the work in Vietnam that followed is Nancy Pocock, who was both a friend and a mentor and uh, who meant a huge amount to me in my CFSC journal uh, journey. So I wanted to talk most about the two times that I actually worked for Canadian Friends Service Committee. First, uh, Quaker Committee on Jails and Justice, and then as the coordinator for Service Committee. I actually joined uh, Quaker Committee on Jails and Justice in um, 1976. I was doing a degree, Master of Social Work degree at Carleton University, and I was able to negotiate both of my practicums uh, working with UCJJ. At the time, it was actually called the Young Street Half Yearly Meeting Prison Committee. Um, but the name changed quite quickly, and then eventually it was incorporated into service committee. At the time I was there, all of the funding was coming from service committee. And of course, Ruth Morris was another friend who was very much involved because at the time she was the coordinator of service committee. One of my first tasks was to set up a jail program in the Don Jail. Um, the committee had wanted to do this and had not yet been able to. Um, I was actually able to put that together in about six weeks, and we set up a volunteer program which saw us going into the Don Jail every week um, under the chaplaincy program to meet in a very bare room uh, with wooden chairs with anybody who wanted to come together with us. A couple of times the chapel was already booked, and so we met on the ranges uh, at the time. The ranges were this big concrete. Um, blocks with cells across, uh, with bars across the front. On one side there were benches and on the other side there were the uh, doors into the cells. The cells themselves, I went into one once and I could put my two hands out and touch both walls and they were equipped with a bed and a bucket. I think there were about 20 cells uh, in, uh, in a range and the range was where the people ate their meals and spent their daytimes and they were locked in their cells at night. So a couple of things that remain vivid in my memory about that. The first is that with apologies to Toronto friends, one day we raided the Toronto flower garden before we went to the jail and show you how different it is than it is today. We were actually allowed to bring those flowers in. We gave some to the guards, we took the rest up to the, cha uh, to the chapel and I had an iris that one of the prisoners received and the intensity with which he spent our entire time building a relationship with the beauty of that flower was just incredibly moving. And the incredible contradiction between the flowers that we brought in and the 
chapel area, which was bare of anything, and the cells and the ranges was just so, so telling. The other is that um, one time I was actually given a gift that I was not supposed to bring out, but of course I did. One of the prisoners, the participants in the program was so thankful for our being there that he took his shoelace out of his boot and made me a cross. And this is it. Um, he wanted to express how important our program was to him. And this has traveled with me throughout my life to remind me of the time that we spent in the Don Jail. So once we experienced the jail, not surprisingly, we needed to do something about it because we saw how damaging it was to the people who were in there, the people who worked there, and to the people in the community because it wasn't resolving community conflict. So we did this work in collaboration with some friends in the United States, and they resourced us with a book called Instead of Prison. I would have shown you what that looked like, except that my copy has gone visiting and it never came home. But it had a five part program that actually was a penal abolition program that we started uh, using in our work. And the five parts were stop building prisons. If we have them, we fill them. Develop alternating sentencing models so that we don't put people into them. Adapt those sentencing models, get out those people who are already in prison, because we know that the longer people are in prison, the less likely they are to be able to uh, reconnect with society once they get out. Find effective and compassionate ways of working with the perhaps 10% of people in prisons who actually are a danger to themselves and to others. Minimally, that should do no harm and hopefully it would help them to heal. Uh, and finally, transform society into one of justice and equity. So one of the uh, educational tools that we developed uh, is that we built a mock-up of a Don jail cell. And this was in the mid seventies when there were community fairs all over the place. And we would haul this on a trailer behind my little Civic Honda Civic um, to these community fairs, and we would invite people to spend time locked up in these jail cell and the jail cell. And one of the people who really supported that, and here are the next picture, please, was Arthur Clayton, who will also be remembered by some friends here. And Kira, if you could put the next photo up. Uh, this is our mock up jail cell, and this is Arthur locked in it, and this was at Canadian Yearly Meeting in Alma, Ontario. Um, we also did a, a lot of court watching uh, because the evidence had been that when you actually have observers in the court, the standard of justice tends to improve. Um, and my master's uh, project, uh, instead of a thesis, was actually to develop um, a court watching manual so that people could do some background work and when they went into courts, they knew the languages, they knew what was going on and they could be much more effective in um, noting what was going on. I have to confess, I find it really discouraging that here we are almost 50 years later, still doing, needing to address many of the same sorts of issues we were addressing in the mid 1970s. Um, our federal penitentiary in Manitoba is Stony Mountain. It's mainly 80% full of Indigenous men, many of whom are survivors of the child welfare system. Uh, it is one of the most dangerous prisons in Canada, and it's recognized that it's generally run by um, gangs. Uh, and uh, there's recently been some exposés again in the Winnipeg Free Press um, one of the things that I have from mom, Muriel, is um, a, a medal that she received from the Correctional Services of Canada for presenting on domestic violence. And I am planning to send it back to the responsible minister 
uh, asking what they intend to do to change um, the situation at Stony Mountain. So I left QCJJ when the time was right for me. Uh, and as you know, it's developed and Nancy is now the wonderful staff person for that work. Um, I moved into various parts of Canada and did various bits of things and came back uh, to Toronto in uh, 1986, uh, having registered at York University to do a Master of Environmental Studies. Uh, under that program, you could study just about anything and it was environmental and I was looking at international development and women's spirituality. I was attending Young Street meeting and um, was sitting in meeting one day minding my P's and Q's as one does. And I literally felt like I was hit by a bolt of lightning. It was a shock. And the message I get was apply for that CFSC coordinator's position that is empty now. I've been telling you to do it. You've not been listening, pay attention. So it was like, okay. And I applied and I got the position for the coordinator of uh, Canadian Friends Service Committee. And that has, it was such a gift to me to spend those five years as the coordinator, uh, the position is now called the general secretary. Um, so I did a lot of administration and uh, I had two uh, program areas that I was responsible for, uh, international development and uh, indigenous rights. So with the international development, I had an amazing trip to uh, Mexico and Central America. I stood with Mexican uh, peasants uh, tasting honey on the spoon that went around the circle um, of their uh, honey cooperative, uh, listening to this project supported by CETAPAC, one of our partners. Uh, CETAPAC stands for Servicio Desarrollo y Paz, Service Development and Peace. And they were talking about indigenous land rights uh, and sustainable development. Um, I, um, I traveled on uh, and spent time in Nicaragua. Uh, this was still during um, some of the, the war there. And I traveled uh, by Jeep, by hollowed out log with a motor on the side of it, down a river and for about an hour across a, ha um, a harbor where the waves were taller than we are and uh, in a punga, which is a type of motorboat up into the um, land where the Contra were still active, visit a project um, where with Pronica, our partner in Nicaragua, we had been able to get um, data funding to get a, a sawmill into this community. See the difference that a sawmill can make because you can build housing, you can build um, farm structures. Uh, we stayed in a bombed out um, health center uh, had been bombed by the Contras and rebuilt. And we were uh, admonished to be careful at night when we went out to the outhouse because El Tigre was around at night. Um, I had an amazing experience going on to El Salvador with our partner Peace Brigades International and Elaine Hawkins. Um, so the next photograph, please. Um, um, this is a photo of Elaine leading um, a peace training program in Kingston, Ontario, and I'm in the yellow uh, sweatshirt in the back. Um, we visited some of the uh, people being accompanied by Peace Brigades International volunteers, um, and uh, a story that we were told by the man that we were, uh, who was being accompanied, and he, he told us about a death threat that he had received and we said well what did you do and he said oh I just ignored it they said that they would kill me within two days but the postmark was six days ago so I figured I didn't need to worry um, and that sort of I mean what courage but the international work and the indigenous rights work became too much so uh, we hired Susan Reeser so the next picture please Kira Susan became our international development worker. And this is a picture of Susan and Ian Achak. Ian at the time was the administrative uh, worker. 
and Susan took over the international development work. And when I was going through the um, photograph gallery, I found at least seven photographs, I think, with Susan in it. So have been able to, um, uh, El Tigre was a big cat, not a man. Somebody asked me. Um, so I then focused on uh, indigenous rights. I had been asked when I joined a service committee to choose a special ministry that was going to be particularly important to me. And I chose indigenous rights. Um, Betty Peterson, next photo please, uh, had been our representative on Project North. And Betty asked me to uh, take on the indigenous rights work, which I did feeling really privileged to do that. Um, Betty um, had, as I mentioned, been on our, our Project North representative. Project North was the ecumenical coalition working in solidarity with indigenous peoples. And it was in a process of uh, self-destructing because of conflict. Um, so I was at the meeting with indigenous leaders and chiefs when um, Project North announced that it was going to be uh, laying itself down. And the response from the chiefs was, well, if you have to do it, do it, but do it fast because we need you at the barricades with us. So I was part of the uh, ecumenical group that reformed over a year and created the Aboriginal Rights Coalition Bracket Project North. Um, we set up a three-part power sharing organization with indigenous partners, local solidarity groups, and national churches. And we moved the office to Ottawa. And I confess that we did that partly to be near the national indigenous organizations, but partly have a little bit of distance from some of the church headquarters. But felt some tension about um, the power sharing and concern that if you put a lot of the money in, you might need a little more say about how it was used. So some of the highlights of my time with ARC, I was elected as the first uh, chair of the board of the Aboriginal Rights Coalition. I was part of a church delegation to the James Bay Cree while they were fighting against getting their rivers dammed up. Um, we went there during the spring goose hunt. I was towed for three hours over the pack ice of Hudson Bay, and I have never been so cold in my life. Um, the guy who was on the um, skidoo got at least the warmth from the, um, from the engine. We stayed in a goose camp um, for a number of days, uh, which was an amazing experience in a white tent sleeping about 11 people to a tent on spruce boughs um, and uh, learning about the lifestyle. Unfortunately, the geese were late that year, so I never got to try roast goose. Um, we also saw uh, on our way back, the one dam that had already been built to divert two major rivers into a third river and saw some of the devastation to the indigenous way of life. The water, of course, became polluted with mercury leaching out of the water and the fish that were part of the lifestyle were uh, not going to be safe to eat for something like 70 years. I traveled in solidarity with my Anglican colleague, Peter Hamill, uh, to as close as the military would let us to Gunasatage Oka uh, during the Oka crisis to express our solidarity with the with the Indigenous people. I was one of the presenters to the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples that ARC presented. And um, so if you could put the next picture up, um, Kira, this is the uh, cover to the short uh, report. And if you haven't looked at it, it's an amazing 20 year model that can take us from where we were then to justice to indigenous peoples, including being funded out and telling us how much money we would save at the end. Um, and one of the senses that I feel very deeply about is that we could not figure out how to first encourage, present, we uh, as allies and in the indigenous people leading the struggle, get the Royal Commission uh, implemented. It was shelved with indigenous peace. Um, 
and I visited the Inu during their resistance to um, the NATO base that was being proposed for their land. Uh, again, spending time out on the land, seeing and hearing about the destruction of the low level flying, what it was doing to the migration paths of the caribou that was central to the Inu's uh, lifestyle and supporting and witnessing the Inu who would cut through the fence and go and march along with a cross in, on the runway to prevent the jets from landing. Um, I mean, I'm an incredible witness of nonviolent uh, intervention. Um, during that time, the big uh, witness of Canadian yearly meeting was our standing in solidarity with the Lubicon Cree Nation when they blockaded their land. Uh, this was in 1988. We actually had yearly meeting that year in Lacombe, Alberta. And um, the chief, Bernard Omniac, and one of his elders came down to invite us to stand with them when they blockaded their land in uh, the fall of that year. So three of us, um, after the discernment of the yearly meeting, were asked to represent the yearly meeting at the Lubicon blockade. And um, if you can put the next picture up, please, Kira. That's Jack Ross, uh, Betty Peterson, and myself. And that's Betty facing us in the white and Jack in the hat. Um, there were other friends who talked about coming with us, but we insisted that everybody who went on the blockade should do nonviolence training first. We did two nonviolence training events. Next picture, please. The first one on Toronto Island. Uh, and so this is um, that event you can see in HAC in the blue. Uh, Frank Scholler in the red uh, in the middle just by the uh, CN Tower, uh, Colin McMeekin, Betty Peterson in the pink, uh, I'm in the blue, and Elaine Hawkins is in the white. Um, and then we did another nonviolence training at the West Yearly Meeting. And as a result of the nonviolence training, all the other people who'd thought to join us discerned that they were not then ready to go into a situation that may result in violence. So it was just Jack and Betty and I who drove up uh, from Edmonton uh, for eight hours up to Lubicon territory. We went early because there were rumors that the RCMP were going to blockade the land. Um, and uh, if you can put the next picture up, uh, Kira, uh, we made posters such as the one that Betty is uh, is holding here. This was the first day of the blockade. Um, and we uh, camped around the land on four campsites. Betty and I were at campsite two. Um, and by the time uh, the blockade was taken out, it was on the Sunday. On the Thursday, it was taken out by the RCMP. Uh, and we were living in snow and surrounded by uh, ice and snow. So. If you can put the next picture up, please. This is Betty um, in the process of being arrested. She had actually been asked by the leader on our campsite to clean up the road and the uh, arresting officer was not willing to accept. You can see that she has the cups in her hand. I had already been picked up and taken into a police car. And on the back at the left there, you can see a man in battle fatigues he had face paint and he was holding a submachine gun. Um, I have to say I was stunned that in Canada, a, a country of peace, this level of violence would be used against us. Um, and it's also true that the RCMP gathered indigenous officers and brought them all together. So it was indigenous officers facing indigenous, indigenous resistors. Um, at the chief's instructions, uh, we all, uh, when we were taken to court that night after spending the day in jail, we were taken out of the blockade about seven in the morning. Um, we all agreed to recognizances, not go back onto the blockade. Uh, and the next day, the premier and the chief 
negotiated uh, a settlement. But despite that, we were all required to go to court because the settlement did not include uh, the withdrawal of the charges. And so this is the message that we got from the chief um, that we would have to go back to court. And the grandmother of the Lubicons was Betty. Um, we were considered um, the Rambo Quakers with the Lubicon sense of humor. Uh, and there was a little article on in the paper, in the Edmonton paper, shortly after we were all arrested, in which the chief at a community meeting said at the end of the meeting, things are really serious. They have our Rambo Quakers. So we did go to court, uh, neither Betty nor I, the charges were not uh, pursued against us. Um, the first person arrested, uh, a Lubicon member was tried and convicted and fined and never paid fine. And the agreement with the Lubicon was never implemented. Um, and so that event with a uh, yearly meeting has been a critical part of my CFSC journey, and it is still part of CFSC's journey um, with Indigenous rights. So when I left service committee, I was incredibly grateful for the work that I'd been able to do because the Indigenous rights work that I started has been part of my journey uh, right through until now. Um, so after leaving service committee, I spent four years um, after doing a year of education, uh, getting my um, Bachelor of Education degree, spent four years working on the land with the Libicon, um, doing all sorts of work with the women, with the youth, um, uh, supporting the chief in the negotiations in any way I was able to. Um, I was so angry after that work because I had seen the duplicity of the Canadian government in my name that I have to leave Canada. And I went and spent some time in um, England and Scotland. That resulted in seven years of my working with Ben Pink Dandelion, whom some of you know, on a PhD thesis called um, Quaker Peace Testimony and Land, a challenge to Quakers. Uh, and that was such a gift to spend that time with Ben. When I returned in 2004 uh, to Winnipeg, I started following up on one of my visions coming out of my PhD work uh, and am now still working uh, with a small group of um, people. Uh, and if you could put the next picture up, please, Kira. Um, we are creating uh, with the direction of elders uh, a reparations-based organization, uh, which is working with settlers and newcomers around what it actually means to be a good treaty member. We live on treaty territory. The um, Manitoba Treaty Relations Commission um, with whom we are collaborating, and in fact, that's where this picture was taken uh, at their, they used to have us meet in their meeting room as long as they were in Winnipeg. Um, and um, they had a, a campaign called We Are All Treaty People, and that is where the name of our organization came from. And so um, I continue to be connected with service committee by being uh, a member of both the um, associates, both for the Quaker uh, Indigenous Rights Committee and the Criminal Justice Committee. And so uh, stay involved and connect with them um, and uh, liaise with them. So I wanted to start, uh, to finish rather, by um, reading a poem. And if you could put the next uh, slide up, please. Sarah. This is a poem that was published in a book of poetry with both an Indigenous and non-Indigenous poet writing a poem for every article, of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Lila June is the author of this poem. She's an Indigenous woman. And this is the one that speaks to me. 
This is about Article 2, which talks about um, the rights of Indigenous people to be respected as all other rights. The old ones say, the Creator writes your rights in the pages of your life. Read them in the stars. Listen to the voice of the earth when the snow melts and all the soil exhales. She will help you understand. You have no rights, but the right to choose love or choose fear. And my response to Lila Jen's poem is, we always need to be choosing love. So that's me, it's part of my journey. Um, and we're now moving into the time for questions and conversation. And I thought as a transition, um, would share with you one of the photographs that I brought away of the CFSC committee in March, 1991. And I thought people would enjoy looking for friends and uh, possibly see themselves in this photograph. And it seemed a nice way to transition from my talking to yours. So Nancy will now sort of take over and moderate for us. Thank you so much, Elaine. Um, so I don't know if if um, if anybody is here that either was in that photo or recognizes people in the photo. If you feel comfortable speaking up and maybe giving a remembrance of that, I invite you to do that. Is there anyone here that was in the photo? I wasn't in the photo, but I recognize Steve Abbott, lower left, and Paul Van Gusen, lower right. Vince Hugh Elliott, just behind Nancy Pocock. Vince the lower right. Yep. Oh, that's Vince. <laughs> oh, Vince. okay. Sorry. Vince is here. Yeah. The Horvath is standing next to Nancy Pocock. Yes. And Keith, are you there? Is that you behind Nancy? Who's that with? No, up behind. Two rows up. Is that you on the left, Keith? Maddox? In the yellow, you mean? Yeah, the yellow shirt. Frank Scholler is behind the person in the yellow shirt. Yeah. And Phil Esmond is in the bright yellow shirt. Yeah. Uh, Joe Vellicott standing next to Betty Peterson. Sylvia Powers at the far end there. So lots of, uh, lots of great folk. Right. So and where was that again, Elaine? Where was that taken? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure where that was taken. Hmm. Barbara or Vince, do either of you remember where that photograph was taken? Not only do I not remember it, but I hardly recognize myself. <laughs> But I did see Dorothy <laughs> James there too. I, yeah, I saw Dorothy. That's right, Dorothy <laughs> James is there. Well, that person in the picture looks something like me, uh, <laughs> but it's not me. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. Right. Let's, see, let's see the picture again. The one that's not Vince, I, that's who I thought was Paul Van Gusen. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's really neat to see. But I have no idea where it is. Betty Peterson in the pink short figure at the back on the right. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think that's, Could that be George Webb? Yes. Come and look at this and see if this is your picture, George. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's Tim Benson behind uh, yes. Van Gusen. Yeah. Yes, it is. Ah, right. And I think the lovely man with the white hair is from Argenta. Herb Herbison, maybe? That's Hugh Herbison, Hugh with, Herbison the yes. with the mustache. Yeah. And Michael Miller next to Nancy, um, his last name escapes me at the moment. 
in the second row above Steve? Yes, Michael Miller. Yes, I knew he looked familiar. Hmm. Anybody know if you go back from Michael Miller, who the young man is with looks like a mop of black hair? Might maybe he was a CFSC young intern or something. He looks really young. Yeah, no, that that was before we had interns, I think. So It's a great gathering. Good picture. So Elaine, it looks like there's a question in the mm -hmm. chat. I'll read it out so that everybody can hear it, if that's OK. When you were the chair uh, of the Board of Aboriginal Rights Coalition, how were you received as a non-Aboriginal? And were you arrested for activism while in that board chair role for ARC? You live the peace testament, Elaine. Um, I, my experience was that I was very much welcomed uh, as um, a non-Aboriginal uh, working in solidarity. I mean, it was really clear to us that we needed to be taking our directions from the Indigenous people. And, and I mean, I think some of the very earliest work CFSC did in the sort of 50s, 60s um, of solidarity with Indigenous peoples, we were much more resourcing them in terms of skills and support. And by the 70s and 80s, they had really um, expanded their capacity and were very much taking direction. Uh, and that was part of the reason why when we set up the Aboriginal Rights Coalition, it was so important to us that they be in a strong power position on that board. Um, I wasn't arrested again uh, as chair of the Aboriginal Rights Coalition. Um, I mean, I might've been, but I didn't. When I was with the Lubicon, um, when I went back there the second time to spend the four years that I did with them, I was still chair of, of ARC and was seen very much by the churches as the church representative uh, on the ground with the Lubicon. Um, and that enabled us to do a lot of solidarity work. So for instance, one of the other things we organized while I was there for that four years was the first um, World Council of Churches, eminent church leaders visitation to Canada because both Alberta and Canada were not engaging with the Lubicon. They, they worked for years to try and get treaty. Uh, they were tossed back and forth almost like a tennis ball. Uh, you know, the that's what play good cop, the province bad cop, and then that switch. Um, confidential documents were leaked and used to organize opposition to the Lubicon, um, including to the extent of pulling together two never before, before heard of Indian bands, one to the west and one to the east of the Lubicon to try and take away their membership um, and the eminent visitors was a model that had been used in South Africa quite effectively uh, and so the World Council of Churches church leaders from India um, from the United States the head of the uh, Black Anglican or Episcopal Church in the United States uh, a woman who was a, a member of the Sami uh, in Norway with their church um, the uh, World Council of Churches Indigenous Rights uh, staff person. And we spent time on the land with the Lubicon, with their sharing their story with these uh, eminent church delegations. We then traveled to El um, Edmonton, where the Alberta government refused to meet with us, and we did uh, media work. And then we traveled on to Ottawa where the federal government met with us, but not very successfully as far as we were concerned. And again, we did media work. So the fact that I was there partly uh, at, through Mennonite Central Committee, I was there as a Mennonite Central Committee voluntary service worker, but our interconnection with the national churches and also therefore through World Council of Churches enabled us to do some advocacy that we couldn't have done without some of those connections. 
Thank, thank you. That was very um, eloquent. Uh, dip, you were a bridge builder. You were a diplomat between all all the all the all the tribes and and all the government and organizational forces. And what year was what years did you serve uh, ARC? Um, I would have become the chair in 1989, which was when ARC started. And I think I served for four or five years. This um, was during OCA? The 89 was during OCA as well. Uh, OCA, I think, was 92. Jen, help me oh. if I've got my years wrong. Oh, um, yeah. It, yeah, into the 90s. Okay. Uh, and then, OCA was 1990. Yeah. Oh, 90. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I stayed, as I say, I stayed with ARC um, for about after I moved to Lubicon territory. Um, I, I cringe now, I have to say, thinking about my carbon footprint uh, when I was um, chair of the Aboriginal Rights Coalition, because at that time I was also a Cork of Yearly Meeting um, and uh, was one of the small group of people who would turn up at the East River Airport, there was a small network of us and, and the, you know, the little dinky plane would land and we only had to arrive about half an hour before the flight again, tells you how the world has changed. <laughs> and they would scoot us all onto this aircraft that would um, take us down to Edmonton or Calgary and then they would take us off the plane and then they would make us go through security and then put us back on the plane, um, which always seemed a very bizarre thing to me, but... Um, Yeah. Okay. So okay. I'd like to um, introduce Adrian Bishop. I think he has something to share. Hello, Elaine, and hello, friends. Uh, I'm calling you from Baltimore. Um, so it's nice to uh, get this CFSC link. I thought I would try to uh, uh, correct your memory about okay. 1951. Okay. Now, I'm not a whole lot older than you, but I do remember that we stayed with the stars mm -hmm. in Newmarket yeah. when we came to yeah. Canada. Uh, Fred uh, was very much part of our circle, mm -hmm. but we, we only visited them occasionally. We stayed with the stars mm -hmm. yep, uh, for that. several months. So, yep. uh, and of course, we've reconnected with them off and on uh, through Grindstone and things like that. Yep. So. It's been lovely to hear your story. I've learned a lot about my sister tonight. Thank you. <laughs> so we have another question in chat, Elaine. And the question is, what did, did you, yeah, what did you do to deal with your own feelings of anger at the Canadian government duplicity? You went to the UK, you worked with Ben Dandelion, question mark. So um, I, I did a number of things. I mean, first of all, I left Canada, which I think was actually really important because I was getting the sense that it was increasingly hard for me to stay nonviolent. Uh, and it, with my commitment to um, Quaker Peace Testimony, um, I needed distance from, from the situation. Uh, I was uh, uh, offered a free term at Wood Quaker Study Center, which is where I first connected with them. And uh, during that time, I learned of an 11 week intensive conflict analysis and intervention program that was being run at Woodbrook by a Quaker organization calling Responding to Conflict. Um, and I was able to raise the funds to take that program. So I was one of 28 people, um, most of whom English was a second, third, or fourth language, although the course was in English, um, half of whom were coming out of Africa and about 25% of whom were coming out of hot war situations. And we used our the situations in which we'd been in conflict as the content to practice the conflict analysis tools um, and the interventions that we were learning about. So I did a lot of processing during that time, which was really helpful. But I also, by working and, and getting to know Ben and taking one of his courses, 
learned about the opportunity to do a PhD in Quaker studies. And so um, I put a proposal forward that Ben strongly supported uh, and he was my key, uh, my primary advisor, looking at the whole area of Quaker peace testimony and land. Because my sense was, although a lot of work has been done on Quaker peace testimony, nobody has really intentionally looked at land, particularly in the context of indigenous rights. Um, I used Canada and Scotland as my two uh, case studies. Um, when I left uh, Lubicon and after visiting my brother Steve in the West Coast, I ended up in Scotland. Within 10 days, I was in the living room of a Quaker in Northern Scotland hearing him say, if they don't give us our land and our rights, we will have to separate. You know, and so I came from an indigenous context where that made sense. And I landed in a Scottish context where it also made sense. And I was interested in how did Quaker Peace Testimony get used by the friends in those two different locations to address uh, the land rights conflict. Um, and uh, it was such an incredible gift to spend those seven years working. It was a part-time PhD, so that's why it took seven years. And that's when I was working as the warden, which is what um, what Quakers call the people who live and run the Quaker meeting houses. We call them the people who run the prisons. Um, and so I was the warden, resident warden of the Quaker meeting house in Glasgow throughout that time. Um, and that was also really neat because I got involved in some of the peace activities there and in particular, uh, the movement that uh, Quakers in England and Scotland uh, were developing to invite the, uh, the British government to get rid of its nuclear weapons. It was a process called Trident Plowshares 2000 because the Trident nuclear powered and nuclear uh, missile uh, uh, submarines were all based at Faz Lane, which is 25 miles from Glasgow. So we were a prime target uh, for any conflict between the East and the West um, and uh, of course, you won't be surprised that Britain did not uh, give up its nuclear weapons, but um, we did a lot of activities uh, and actions outside the Faslane um, nuclear base. And uh, for the first few of those, uh, the Quaker Meeting House was where people came after they were um, released from jail. Uh, then it got to be, we weren't big enough because so many people were being arrested, but we still, uh, continued to do some backup support for those actions. You were our connection, were you not to Alistair? Um, uh, McIntosh. McIntosh, thank you, yes. Yes, I was. Uh, Alistair was one of the people, um, Alistair, for those who don't know him, uh, is a, a Scottish Quaker. Uh, in some ways, um, in my mind, Alistair is sort of a modern model of an Old Testament prophet with hair and beard and um, I, I saw him do a presentation to uh, Britain Yearly Meeting one year on mammon and the sins of mammon. And you could just see that old prophet uh, vigor and um, really setting Quakers on their ear about uh, how we needed to be less concerned about money and more concerned about justice. Uh, and so Alistair was one of the people because he's been very involved in land rights in Scotland and in the crofting movement. The crofting movement in Scotland is very much a land rights movement. Um, and so he was one of the people that I interviewed for my thesis. And then when I came back to Canada, it just seemed like some of the work that we were doing in indigenous rights connected with what Alistair was doing. And so um, I made that connection because he actually was coming over to Canada at the time. Uh, one of my favorite books of his is called Soil and uh, Soil, Soul and Soil, um, looking at the whole interrelationship between spirituality and land and, and uh, addressing land rights. So we have another question, a qu sort of comment and a question from Elizabeth and then um, something from Jennifer Preston afterwards. So Elizabeth writes, it seems to me that the Canadian government has a long and consistent history of hostility to Indigenous people and their claims and their rights. 
Is this too harsh? Is it true? What do you think, Elaine Bishop? Um, I think that's a very gentle way of putting it. Um, I think it is absolutely true. Um, I think that, um, I mean, as with anything else, there's always a spectrum, right? Because there are some people in government who I think are supportive. Uh, and I know that when I was going to the UN before Dan was going to the UN around the, uh, the work on the UN declaration, um, I was there when there were some of the liberal uh, party um, uh, people at the UN and they were supportive of the declaration and the negotiations for the declaration. We then had a change of government and they were very hostile and that has continued to this day. I mean, uh, the, the bill C-262 that was uh, proposed by Romeo Saganash, who it's lucky people in Winnipeg, Romeo is now living in Winnipeg. Um, uh, it was defeated by some conservatives, conservative senators, uh, Don Flett, a Manitoba conservative senator being one of them who is again uh, getting in the way, I'm sure, of this uh, C-15, which is now in the Senate. Um, and I mean, I don't tend to talk about land claims because claim somehow suggests that it's not an inherent right. I talk about the inherent land right uh, of indigenous peoples, they were here before us. We're the newcomers and we're the people that stole the land. We're the people, um, the governments that originally came over here with a concept like uh, a doctrine of discovery as if it was a blank land and that as if anybody who's not Christian doesn't count. Um, and uh, it, it has been a very hostile relationship. Um, and I think there is also a lot of fear um, people are afraid that somehow if we do, do justice, uh, we will be kicked off the land. I've only met one Indigenous person who said to me, you guys should all go back to where you came from, which is very legitimate for me. I'm a newcomer here. I don't have ancestors in this soil. So there is somewhere that I could go back to. Um, but most people, uh, most Indigenous people that I've met are not uh, of that persuasion. I mean, I have heard indigenous peoples in Manitoba say to me, no, we do not kill our treaty partners because they are our treaty partners, but we would very much like them to keep the treaty or to keep the spirit of the treaty. Um, and that is very much what I've heard. I've, I've heard, uh, yes, we want land, but we're looking at crown land. We're not looking at taking where your house is. Um, you know, so I think there is lots and lots of potential to do justice. Um, and I do still have to work on my feelings. Um, I use a couple, <coughs> excuse me, I use a couple of, um, <coughs> of processes uh, to deal with my feelings. I do a co-counseling session most mornings. <coughs> and I use a process called EFT tapping because I still get very angry at times. <coughs> and, um, and frustrated because it seems to me, um, I mean, and, and, and RCAP is such a perfect example of that. That model, which would have seen us do justice in 20 years, that would have demonstrated that, in fact, doing justice saves us money. Um, and, and the fact that consistently governments have not done that, uh, I still find myself challenged. I do try and pray for them and hold them in the light, uh, but I'm sometimes very challenged uh, to do that because I do try and do that on a regular basis. So you've touched on it a little bit, but Jennifer Preston has asked a question um, after saying you are such a delight. Uh, can, you, you. can you can you tell you. us a bit more about we are all treaty people? How can we see reconciliation through such such partnerships? So um, it's been a real gift to me to be able to get to know some of the people who were um, and still are. Uh, working with the Treaty Relations Commission of Manitoba, which is a joint 
uh, organization of the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs and the federal government. The first time I talked about uh, what has become Share the Gifts, Honor the Treaties was at a Kairos regional event in Winnipeg where the keynote speaker had been this amazing Cree man whose name is Jamie Wilson. Uh, at the time he was the treaty commissioner uh, for the Treaty Relations Commission. And uh, I talked about this program, which I'd learned about through my research in Australia called Pay the Rent. Now, Australia is a very different situation. There's no treaty there yet. I know they're talking about one now, um, but in the 1970s, um, Quakers and others in Australia, deeply concerned about um, the colonialism there, developed a program called Pay the Rent, where people would form a relationship with the Aborigine nation on whose land they live, work, play, whatever, and each year make a goodwill donation of a certain percentage of their tax bill to that nation. Um, and that program is still going on. I mean, and this was in the 70s. So um, when I came back to uh, Winnipeg, which was in 2004, 2007, I think, 2004, um, this is one of the ideas I brought with me. And so I, after Jamie spoke about the work that they were doing at the Treaty Relations Commission, and as I say, part of what they were working on is this campaign of we are all treaty people, and, and part of the underlying of that is most people tend to think about treaty in terms of them. We made it with them, Indians, that's, you know, and we now call them different by different names. Indigenous is the one that I tend to use most frequently. Um, but no, actually it's us, it's a partnership. The treaty was negotiated between nations. I mean, one of the things that's really interesting if you read the text of Treaty One, and there's this wonderful book, um, and I and one of the young friends in our meeting have just done an education session with Winnipeg friends on what does it really mean for us to renew commitment to treaty um, called uh, Breathing Life into the Stone Fort Treaty, which is the history of Treaty One from the Anishinaabe perspective. You know, which talks about the Anishinaabe protocols, the legal systems, the, the fact that at the time that treaty was negotiated, Anishinaabe were full nations with their own territories, governances, education systems, healthcare systems, everything. And we, we forget that. And we are taught other than that in most of, certainly what I was taught, which is granted a few years ago, even still, we're not, we're not, educating people on what treaty means. So if I accept that I am a treaty partner and I have this little tiny 33 foot by 90 foot piece of land on which my house sits by reason of my being a partner in treaty, what does that actually mean to me? And the treaty commission was starting this campaign at the time uh, and, and Jamie invited me and those people who said, yeah, we wanna start working on this come and meet at the Treaty Commission offices. And in fact, he organized and, and worked with me on our first elders consultation. Um, so that was really an important step. It's been a very slow process of getting a few people together um, and uh, figuring out with guidance all along from the elders without calling on the elders to give a lot of time to us. The elders are very busy people, and it's actually the only two times an Indigenous person has wagged their finger at me with two different elders saying, you white people, you need to educate your own people. We have enough to do. Don't ask us to educate you as well. Um, and so that's partly where Share the Gifts Under the Treaties come from, because there's very little written about so what does it actually mean in 2021 to be a non-Indigenous treaty partner? What does that look like? How does that make our lives different? Um, now, Winnipeg meeting, when the TRC reported, we actually asked um, an Indigenous, um, we consider him an elder, he doesn't consider himself an elder, not surprisingly, hold a circle with us. 
as we tried to discern what we should be doing as Winnipeg Quaker meeting around uh, responding to the TRC. And one of the things that Vince said to us was, you know, we Indigenous people, we celebrate treaty. You guys need to learn to celebrate treaty as well. And so out of that came a group of Quakers when we were gathering with a group of Mennonites around Indigenous rights um, at Thunderbird House, which is an Indigenous center in Winnipeg. We talked about the idea of maybe we should put on a settler initiated treaty celebration. And the Mennonites say, you do the planning, we'll bring the food. And so for the past six years, that's what we've done. Although they have actually given us staff time um, and I Central Committee of Manitoba, their Indigenous Relations staff person is part of our planning committee. And so this year, uh, which is a very special year in Manitoba, because this is the 150th commemoration, not celebration, commemoration of Treaties 1 and 2 that were both signed um, August 3rd for Treaty 1 and later at the end of August for Treaty 2 in 1871. And our people have been the people who haven't got treaty. And so we are trying to discern what it actually means for us to be members of treaty. So this will be the fifth annual treaty celebration. Um, and uh, right from the beginning, we've had entertainment, we've had feasting, um, we've had the treaty commissioner every year spoken at our gathering. We've held it at a, a space at the Forks in Winnipeg, which some of you remember, not the Odina Circle, um, which is an Indigenous space. We thought this needs to be a non-Indigenous space in which we recognize the indigeneity of it. Um, last year, we had to pivot fast, as did everyone else, and we actually produced a very um, moving and wonderful uh, program that if anybody's interested in looking at it, go to the UMFM, which is the radio station of the University of Manitoba. They broadcast our treaty celebration and it is down on their list of special events. Uh, and it included some really interesting conversation between um, Loretta Ross, who is the treaty commissioner and Michael Champagne, is a really well-known young Indigenous activist in uh, Manitoba, and he was our MC. Um, and we had um, uh, Ray Coco Stevenson, who's really well-known in the powwow community, um, uh, bring his walking wolf powwow troupe, so demonstrating and talking about the different styles of uh, Indigenous dance. Um, this year, we're planning a special commemoration as part of the treaty celebration in which Winnipeg Meeting has already committed to recommitting to treaty. And now we're trying to work out with Winnipeg Meeting, but how does that change us? How is our behavior different? Uh, in the same way with, um, oh, thanks, Nancy, that's great. Um, how are we different by making this commitment? How does it change who we are uh, because we are recommitting, continuing the treaty relationship? Um, and we have found, I mean, each year and each time we take the treaty celebration out, uh, we find more people who are um, interested in, and involved. And this year, um, I, I'm incredibly honored because the Elders Council at the Treaty Commission has taken over the planning for the commemoration ceremony that we said we wanted to be involved in. They're taking some of our ideas because we talked about walking from the four directions, coming together, uh, hearing about treaty, making some sort of a commitment, doing a gift exchange during a feast, and then walking out as our commitment, continue taking out to newcomer and settler people in Manitoba what it means to be treaty people. Um, here are the gifts under the treaty. We have just launched our website. Uh, it is honorthetreaties.ca with 
no spaces in honor the treaties. Um, and we are coming up on June 21st. We will be holding our first, our third annual general meeting. And, and we're talking about, okay, so how do you decolonize an annual general meeting? In Manitoba, you have to be a nonprofit if you're gonna get a bank account. If we want a reparations fund, we have to have a bank account. Uh, so how do we decolonize the structures that are set up in, um, in being a nonprofit? Uh, and the fact, um, again, we've, we've um, continued, we continued meeting at the Treaty Commission until they moved out of the city uh, onto a treaty territory. Um, and um, yeah, we're continuing that journey to try and figure out how we actually are really good uh, treaty partners. And certainly that means taking the message out um, and looking at how we get more and more people in uh, the Treaty 1 territories. Um, over time, we will hope to expand to other treaty territories in Manitoba and across the country. I mean, and what we're saying is like, if you want to do this in, in your treaty territory, take it and everything that we've done, you can use freely and adapt it to your situation. And also adapt it if you're in a non-treaty situation. I mean, the pay the rent in Australia is non-treaty. Um, so yeah, it, it's a journey. Wow. Elaine, I'm looking at the time and I'm also hearing that your voice is sounding a little bit tired out, a little bit raspy. So yes. you might uh, you might be ready to to um, to end the, the talk. Are you? Well, as people who know me know, I will talk about this stuff until you're blue in the face. Um, so I'm always delighted to have um, have more questions. Um, and I mean, the journey continues. We're, we're not finished. I mean, we'll be back again um, the end of next month with the next one of these events, which I think is Jen. It is Jennifer um, Preston, yes. Which I'm really looking forward to. So Me too. Um, yeah, the journey continues. And um, we can finish when people are ready to finish, which could be now if that's where we need to go. Does anyone else have a, a last question or a comment they'd like to make before we stop? And can I just say, Becky, um, I just Google pay the rent and it usually comes up um, from Australia. I don't know if you can see this. And if you can, it's backwards, it's mirror image. This was published in the uh, Toronto Monthly Meeting newsletter some time ago. It's a photo that Keith Maddock took. Somebody put up in High Park uh, a light switch and screwed it to a tree. And at the top of the switch, it says love. And at the bottom of the switch, it says fear. Oh. When I saw that, I saw it, that's right. The opposite wow. of love is not hate, it's fear. Mm. And of wow. course, the switch is up. Mm. 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 Thank um, you. I had, sorry, sorry Nancy, I, no, I just had, want to say one thing. Um, when, when on my previous time through CFSC, I was in uh, Quakers Fostering Justice and I had the opportunity to take part in um, an AVP workshop that we held at the North Point Douglas Women's Center, which is just one small footnote to such a such a an amazing list of uh, activities that Elaine has been in. Anyway, if you think that Elaine is is just busy all the time and uh, never has fun, well. We did a, a perfectly frivolous thing during that, during one evening at that workshop, and that was to go to a Winnipeg Gold Eyes baseball game, and um, I had such a so, so much fun uh, taking Elaine to a baseball game with uh, a couple of other people who were at the workshop.
it's interesting when I was doing my research this afternoon, there, there are little stories like that peppered here and there. And there was one on a, some sort of a road trip, Elaine, that you went on. And it was called the Thelma and Louise road trip. And I don't know which one you were, but do you remember that? I well, you know what I'm referring to? No? No. Oh, I'll find it and I'll send it to you. Great. I'll find the reference. <laughs> yeah. Because that sounds fun, whatever that was. <laughs> there are lots of comments in the chat. Um, thanking you. I thank you too. I thank you so thank much. You. It was so interesting. And uh, I could listen to you for hours. I really could. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to everyone for joining us. And we do hope that you will join us next month on June 24th, when it is the one and only Jennifer Preston that will be speaking. Mm -hmm. And also Kira has asked me to ask you if you have ideas about how we can improve future get to know the friend events. She's um, for either suggestions for speakers or um, any other thing that you can think of that might make it better. Then please email Kira and Kira is going to post her email in chat any moment now I think. Uh, please email her. I don't think we have a survey this time. It's just uh, there it is Kira at Quakerservice.ca. And again, thank you to Kira for organizing this. Yes, thank you, Kira. And uh, doing all the work ahead of time. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, Elaine, it was just wonderful. Thank well, you. and thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share. And like I say, never just been me on my own. It's always been in community. And so thank you. Thank you.